stage, and you know, she's the real deal. She's the real deal. She, uh, what she sings about and what you hear in the words uh, really come uh, from her heart and the life that she's lived. And I just, I'm real excited for tonight. I think it's going to be a, a, a fantastic, fantastic blessing. So hope uh, you can make it uh, tonight. Well, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but we're starting a new series today called Press Play. And the idea behind it is there are moments in life where, for whatever reason, we feel like the pause button gets pushed, that maybe the kind of person that we want to be, we just, we feel like we can't get to it, or maybe there's things that, we, that matter to us that we think are important, but we never seem to kind of get to that spot and live that out. And so this series is going to be looking at some of those different areas where maybe you feel like the pause button gets pushed a little bit, and we want to talk about how to push the play button. What, what are things that Scripture has talked about that help us engage into this life that we were meant to live? Because we're all meant to live this amazing life. If you're a follower of Christ... You have meaning, you have purpose, you were created, you know, you're not just some random collection of cells and atoms. You're not some accidental carbon unit crawling around on planet Earth, okay? You have greater value than that. So today, uh, I want to start off and uh, I want to talk about what I think is one of the most difficult requests Jesus ever made, okay? I think one of the most difficult requests he ever made was this. He said uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6 in a little bit. Uh, he said, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. How many of you have ever worried? Yeah, it's just, <laughs> he said, just don't do that. Just don't do that. And see, if we would all just not do that, the sermon would be over and we'd all go home early. I just, you know, said, but, but we're not going to do that. Okay. Uh, worry, uh, worry is a tough thing. It's a hard thing uh, to avoid. Uh, studies have shown, and they've, they've really done this, they've done studies that show that worrying can actually shorten your life. Anyone worried that you're shortening your life right now because you're worrying about worrying about whether it'll shorten your life? <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's a, there's a great show on right now. I've never seen a whole episode, but I've seen like a third of an episode like many times, okay? So one of these days, it'll, I'll get it all TiVo'd uh, all of a show or something. I'll get to watch the whole thing. Maybe you've heard of this show. It's called Doomsday Preppers. <laughs> yeah, okay, we got a few fans in the room, yeah. These are people that are getting ready for the zombie apocalypse now or some other uh, terrible thing that's going to happen to the world, and they get all prepped up and ready for this thing, and it's kind of fun to watch. Uh, there was one uh, that, I, and again, I, I haven't seen a whole episode, so I don't know how this all plays out. I don't know if they're finding many apocalypse, you know, zombie apocalypse now that, you know, this all, I don't know how this works. But uh, part of one that I saw was a lady who, terribly fearful of a pandemic hitting. And so she's getting all ready for this uh, pandemic. And the way she's done this is she's bought like a thousand yards of plastic wrap. I mean, she's got enough plastic wrap to keep uh, wrap all of Tyson's chickens for the next 10 years or something with about 10 miles of duct tape. And she can turn her whole house into a pandemic care center in like an hour and a half. And she even showed him how she does it. And as far as I can tell, it's just strapping plastic to everything in her whole house and her yard. But when they interviewed her afterwards as she was showing how all this works, she's really worried. I mean, she's really tied up in knots in this whole thing. And I got to thinking, she's all prepared for something, but she's not enjoying life now. I don't think she'll enjoy life later. She's, this, she's kind of all the joy part of this is all lost. And, and, it, and it seemed a little sad. Then another time I saw part of an episode and there's this guy who bought a missile silo. Apparently, you can do that. Our government is selling missile silos. I, I didn't know that that was... Uh I, I, I don't know if you go to eBay or where you go, but it, evidently you can, you can buy a missile silo. And so this guy, uh, buy, and, and someone told me later that a church in Tucson bought a missile silo, and they built the church on top of the missile silo. 
I have no idea what the theological implications of that. I'm not even going to try and figure it out. But this guy buys a missile silo and he decks it out. I mean, he's got like, I think he even had like a swimming pool or a spa in this thing. He's got like miniature golf and this giant water purification process. He's got one of the coolest entertainment rooms you've ever seen in your life. I mean, it's decked out. And then they interview him afterwards. And he's like excited, like he's, in fact, you get the idea that, you know, if zombies don't come soon, he's going to be really sad. I mean, because he's done all this work. He's got, he's like, mm, you know, I hope the zombies come soon, you know? And I thought, what a, what a difference. And I got kind of a little bit of a taste of this uh, three weeks ago. I, you know, I try and do a lot of uh, outdoorsy kinds of stuff uh, with my kids. We, we do boogie boarding and surfing and hunting and a uh, little bit of fishing and hiking and camping. We do all that stuff. And whenever I'm out with them, like in the outdoors, just uh, remembering my childhood and all the crazy things I did, I'm always always trying to get my kids prepared for, you know, like, okay, if you get lost, what are you going to do? And I kind of quiz them. Here's, you know, do you, you know, you don't run around like a chicken with its head cut off, screaming and yelling. And, you know, what are you going to do? How do you find, uh, you know, help? What do you do if you run out of water? So I run them through all of this stuff all the time. So three weeks ago, I'm on this little uh, outing, this little father-daughter hunting trip one afternoon. We just went out for the afternoon, having a good time. We're hiking back to the truck. And, I, and what I do oftentimes is I'll tell Colette, I'll say, so now where's the truck? You, I'm not gonna say a thing. It's your job to lead us back there. You gotta use the compass or the Jeep. You've gotta figure this out. So, so she's doing all of that and she's having fun with this thing. And then she asks me this question, totally random. She goes, so dad, am I allowed to drive the truck? <laughs> when, your 11, when your 11 year old daughter asks you this question, you're just like, man. She's, you know, we're, she's almost 16 now and she's only 11. She's asking me about the truck. And I go, no, you're not allowed to drive the truck yet. You can't get your license until I think it's like 36 and then you can get your license and then you can start driving. And, and, uh, and so I said, no, you can't. She goes, hmm, well, let's just say we're out here and like you break your leg or shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> What? She goes, yeah. So like if you shoot yourself in the foot and you know, you can't run the pedals or whatever, would I be allowed to drive the truck then, you know, to take you to a hospital or something? And so I said, well, honey, I suppose if it's an emergency, you know, and you got to get me to the hospital, I, yeah, you can drive the truck then. She goes, oh, that'd be fun. <laughs> so I'm not real sure whether I should be proud of her or like call the authorities on this. I'm not, I don't have that all figured out. Um, uh, so worry, worry, what do you do with this worry thing? And I think what scripture would say, what Jesus, why he says the thing about don't worry, don't worry, is because he understands there's this important truth and it's this, worry is a thief. Worry is a thief. Worry will steal your joy. It will steal your peace. It will steal a sense of contentment where, wherever you are in life. It'll steal contentment. Uh, worry will even steal that sense of you being able to live out your deepest purposes, living out of who God created you to be. And so Jesus makes this request that seems next to impossible. And he says, do not worry. Don't worry. Now, I want us to look at the verse where uh, he says this because we're going to play this out. So if you have your Bibles, or you can just look up here, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, it says this. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry, and look what he says, about your life. Don't worry about your life. Now, I want to say this. When he's driving to something here, uh, but what he's not driving toward is this sense of don't worry about being prepared. He's not saying preparedness is a bad thing, okay? It, it's not a bad thing to say, I'm going to set up a 401, you know? I'm not going it, to, it's not a bad thing to have health insurance. It's not a bad thing to have savings. It's not a bad thing. If, if you want to get, you know, 10 miles of duct tape and 10 tons of plastic wrap and stick it in your garage, go for it, okay? I have, uh, I have a few extra cans of bean with bacon soup in my garage. If the zombies come, I will live off of bean with bacon soup until Jesus returns. I'll, I'll be just fine. Um, preparedness is not what he's saying is wrong here. What he's getting at is this sense of worry that becomes a thief uh, in our life. And he has an aim here. 
The reason he tells us this is because he has a greater aim than just not worrying. Jesus wants to pull us into this deeper sense of what it is to have a kingdom mindset, to think about what, how our lives are to operate that now that we're in the kingdom, now that we have life with God, we should be thinking and living in a different way. And that's his aim. He wants us to, to begin thinking in a different way. And so that's what's going on here. And what he knows is, is that worry will keep us from that. And ultimately in this passage, and we're gonna see it in a little bit here, he's driving to a challenge. There is a challenge that Jesus wants to give all of us here. And if you'll take him up on this challenge, I promise you, it's a tough challenge, but it is a life-giving challenge. It is a challenge that will bring a deeper sense of joy and peace and contentment in your life than you can bring into your life on your own, okay? And so he wants, he's driving towards this challenge, and the first thing he knows is worry, worry will keep us from taking on this uh, challenge. And he knows that we've got to change our thinking. We've got to think like people that are in the kingdom of God. You know, oftentimes we live in a world that pulls our thinking in a different direction. Uh, there's an old psych term uh, that hits at this at one level. It's called counterfactual uh, uh, thinking, counterfactual thinking. And basically, counterfactual thinking is this idea that you can have success, you can have blessings, you can have good things happen in your life, but you don't end up experiencing joy and contentment out of the good things that happen in your life. That, that you know, you can set out some goals, you can accomplish some things, uh, do some wonderful things, but then not experience the joy that should be associated with it. Counterfactual thinking. A great example of this, and they've done studies uh, on this, uh, with the Olympics. In the Olympics, uh, any guesses as to who, what athletes enjoy the Olympics the least? Other than the guy that, you know, goes off the ski slope, uh, makes a wrong turn and breaks every bone in his body, that guy's probably on, you know, the least joy possible. But when you think of the medal winners, bronze, silver, and gold, who, who derives the least amount of joy and satisfaction out of getting their medal? Anyone know? Silver. Y'all are so smart. Did you guess at that? Yeah, yes. Okay, here, here, here's why. Here's why. The guy who gets the bronze medal is just going, oh, I got a bronze medal. I'm on a podium. I'm in the Olympics and I got a medal. He's just, he's going nuts because he got a medal, right? He's just excited to be on the podium with a flag, his country's flag draped behind him. He's excited. The gold medalist, right? He's excited because he got the gold medal and he's going through, everything going through his mind is, I got a gold medal. I got a gold medal. I got a gold medal. But the silver medalist, what the studies have shown this, and again, not every silver medalist, but most of the silver medalists, you know what goes through their mind? <gasps> I didn't get the gold. I didn't get the gold. They just, they focus on this other thing, and yet, there they are, uh, hundreds of com uh, countries, thousands of athletes, and they get a silver medal. And yet there's this kind of counterfactual uh, thinking that goes on and, and they get pulled into this thing where they lose the joy, they lose the contentment that they could have had. And that happens in this world. Oftentimes uh, in this world, uh, we get pulled into this thing where, uh, where we struggle to, to really benefit from what the blessings are that we've received. And Jesus explains it in this way. He, uh, look up a couple of verses, verse 22. Look, here's how Jesus explains this kind of counterfactual thinking. He says this, the eye is the lamp of the body. Now, when he talks about the eye here, it's important to know that in ancient times, the eye was seen as like a, a window to the soul or a window to the heart. That, that to talk about the eye is to talk about the focus of your heart, okay? And so what he's saying is the focus, if the, the focus of your heart illuminates the rest of your being, the rest of your body, whatever your heart focuses on, it will have an effect on the rest of your life. And that's why he says the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, if your focus is good, he's saying, your whole body will be full of light. It's gonna have a positive effect on your whole life. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So you get what he's saying? Now think about what this means. Think about other places where Jesus 
uh, talks about like eyes. For instance, remember the, uh, the, the old passage where Jesus says, if your eye causes you to sin or to stumble, gouge it out. I mean, that, that's, that's one of those fun uh, bedtime verses to, to read. <clears throat> what Jesus is not saying there is, it, you know, get a, get a dull spoon and gouge your eye out if it's giving you problems. That's not what he's saying. Understand what he's saying there is if there is a kind of focus of your heart that is leading you astray, the way you fix that is you've got to find a way to change your heart. You've got, to, you've got to find a way to change the focus of your heart because wherever your heart goes, there goes the rest of you. See, that's what he's getting at. It's also interesting sometimes when Jesus would heal people, in particular, oftentimes when he would heal blind people, not always, but you find this more with blind people than some of the other people that he healed, he would actually touch their eyes. He would actually do things where he would, he would touch their eyes. One story in particular, it's interesting, there are two blind men that come to Jesus for healing, and Jesus touches their eyes. You know, like it's, you know, it's that idea there's something really special here. He touches their eyes. He heals them of their blindness. But of course, uh, when, they, when they open their eyes and now they can see in a physical way, it's more than they've just gained physical sight. It's like their hearts have gained sight. It's like they now see Jesus for who he is. They begin to understand Jesus, Jesus is the savior of the world. Jesus is the one who brings meaning and passion to life. Jesus is the one they wanna live for. And Jesus makes this strange request, uh, probably because he's being chased by the law. Herod Antipas was uh, after him, wanted to kill him. The Pharisees weren't very hot on him. And so he's kind of running around. So he heals these two guys and he says, listen, don't go tell anybody. Don't let let anybody know what I've done here, okay? So then Jesus leaves. What do you think the two guys do? They go tell everybody. <laughs> That's what they do. Why? Why did they go tell everybody? Because they couldn't help it. See, it wasn't just that their eyesight had come back. Their hearts were illuminated. They had this new kind of way of thinking, a new kind of focus. And so Jesus says, your eyes, the focus of your heart is like a lamp to the rest of your body. And getting the focus of your heart right is really very important. And of course, worry can keep you from that. Worry can keep you from that. So think about the world we live in. We live in a world that wants us to focus on a lot of things. We live in a world that says you can't be happy you can't find contentment unless you're the prettiest in the class, unless you're the brightest in the class, unless you've got the nicest house on the block, right? You, you've got to have that, you've got to have the best lawn in your front yard, except for in Tucson, where it's gravel, and gravel's gravel, and so we don't really have that problem here. But in other places, other cities, they have this problem, right, with the lawn. You've got to keep up with the Joneses, and everything is about keeping up with the Joneses. You've got to get that next promotion. You've got to get, uh, you know, you've got to get a higher salary. You've got to do this and everything gets dependent on, the, on all of those measures of success in this world. And sometimes people live for nothing but that. And, they just, and that's everything that they hang on to. But here's the truth of what Jesus is trying to say. He's saying, if your eyes are really focused on that, here's the sad truth. You can be, you can be the prettiest girl in the class. You can have, you can have that big promotion, Right? and still end up being a discontented, miserable grump, <laughs> see? And what Jesus is saying is, you need to have the right focus. The right focus is so important. Can I tell you where scripture most often points us in this kind of focus? When it comes to trying to navigate the world around us, a focus did, instead of on all the things that we need to be or think, have a focus that says, you know, I want to be content. I want to experience real, deep, and genuine godly joy. Whatever my circumstances, I want to experience joy. Whatever my circumstances, I want to experience contentment. See, what we're really after is contentment and joy and a sense of purpose. And what Jesus is saying here is you got to get your eyes focused uh, on, the wrong, on the right thing because if you don't, if you don't, 
uh, you won't get what you're really after in this world. And again, he's driving to this challenge. He's setting us up for this moment in which he wants to extend this kind of challenge uh, uh, to us uh, here. So he gets back to this thing about not worrying. Uh, look with me back at uh, verse 25. Go ahead, go ahead and go to verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 25 uh, there. <clears throat> Here it is. He says this, comes back to that verse that I talked about at the beginning. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will uh, wear. And he goes through all of these kind of what statements, the what's, 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 all the things that create anxiety in our life, all the things that are like, oh, what about this? What about that? What about this? And we can begin getting worried about all of these things. And where he's going with this is he's not saying, uh, don't be concerned about them. He's not, you know, he's not saying that, but he's saying sometimes we can get worried as if we are all on our own. But we're in the kingdom of God. And so he makes this next interesting statement. Look at verse 26 in your Bibles. It says this. He says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. Now pause there for a second. Um, who sows, reaps, and stores away in barns? We do. That's something that as human beings, we have the, the ability to do. We can create things. We can set up businesses. We can, uh, we can become nurses and doctors. We can gain skills. We can, we can invent things and make things. We can start service industries. We can actually plant things. Uh, crops and, and reap and storm and barns <laughs> right there. We can do all of this. And his point is, as human beings, God has blessed us. Because see, it's a blessing. Don't mistake what he's saying here. It is a blessing for us as human beings to be able to sow and reap and store away in barns. That's a good thing. But here's his point. Uh, and yet, uh, and birds can't do that. Birds of the air, can't, they can't do all that. They can't do all of that. But even though they can't do that, and yet, he says, your heavenly Father feeds them. Even though the birds of the air don't have those same blessings as you, your heavenly Father still feeds and takes care of them. See, what, he, what he's trying to do here is he's saying, you need to understand something about the character of God. He is a wildly good God who has good things for you. In fact, Jesus follows up with this amazing statement. Look at the second half of verse 26, and he says this. Are you not much more valuable than they? Because you are. You are. See, and here, here's the point he's getting at. It's not that all those things in life are unimportant. In fact, we're going to look at a verse here in a moment where they are actually very important. What he's driving us toward is trusting in God. Whatever your place in this world, our job first is to think like people who really trust in God, that God has more than enough. God can take care of us, that no matter what we face, no matter what difficulty uh, we ever run into, Whatever we run into, we are quite secure in the God uh, that we serve. And so part of this thinking that Jesus is driving to is this idea, this idea that whatever we process, we're saying to ourselves, I'm secure in God, whatever I face. And, and that sets us up for this very unique kind of challenge. So um, let's, let's get to this challenge. Look at the next verse here. Verse uh, 31 says this. So, and he's going to get back to this worry thing because he knows we're all worrying, okay, all the time. Uh, so, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? And here's all the what statements again. He's kind of coming back to this. Uh, what shall we drink or what shall we uh, wear? For the pagans run after all of these things. Now, when he says pagans here, this is not a derogatory term. He's not saying, those lousy pagans, shame on them. What he's saying is, you know what? That's all they have. All they have is their ability to sow and reap and store up in barns. That's all they have. All they have is the conventional wisdom of this world. They, they're not connected to God in a supernatural way, the way a follower of Christ is. So that's all they've got, right? And he says, uh, for the pagans run after all of these things, now catch this, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. See, Christ is not trying to say that all of those things that, that we look at in this life are wrong. He understands that he made us uh, 
to be wildly creative individuals. We love creative things. We love music. We love art. We love accomplishing things. We love, we love seeing a problem and going after it and solving that issue, using the intellect that he has given us, using the body that he has given us, okay? He so said, those are all good things, but that is ultimately not what we depend on the most. Because we're followers of Christ, we can trust in God first in all of these things. And so uh, here's, here's the challenge that he gives, okay? Here's the challenge that he gives, that he sets up. He's driving this. So he's going to set the priority. He says, but seek first his kingdom, right? What is it to have life with God, his kingdom? What, what is it that God wants to do in this world that matters most to him? I mean, you realize God has thoughts and dreams and a vision for this world. And so he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and, and I love this, and all these things will be given to you as well. You trust God with his kingdom first. You prioritize him. And then you let God be the one that blesses and supplies you. See, that is a wildly different way to think about this world than what the world typically thinks about here. And I want you to know this. Uh, I, I love how he frames this out. Um, he's not trying to push us into a, a, like a cookie cutter mold on this thing. There's no description here of what a, a Christian must be. It's this idea that all these things, you know, we're all different on all those things. We're all wired differently about our desires and our personality and what we do. And I'll say this, we all have a unique calling to what God wants us to do. And part of what Jesus is doing here is he's putting before us this challenge that really kind of comes as this invitation. And the invitation is, will you, will you trust me to put my kingdom first and the idea is that is the pathway to real joy, real contentment, and real satisfaction in this life. That's the ticket. And, uh, you know, oftentimes I hear sermons uh, that talk about the Christian life is being like a cookie cutter Christian, you know, like every Christian needs to do this exactly, and here's how you be a good Christian. Da, 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 da. And it feels a little bit like every Christian's going to look exactly the same. Sometimes <clears throat> they get this notion where scripture talks about uh, part of the spiritual growth process is to grow into the likeness of Christ. And that is very true, very true. But understand what scripture's describing there that as we grow into the likeness of Christ, it's not that we will take on the same exact personality uh, is Christ. It's not like we're gonna like the same flavor bubble gum is, is Jesus, okay? Or our favorite color will be the same favorite color as Jesus. It's not that. Jesus had a unique calling and purpose in this world and he lived it out. And to become like Christ is to come to the place where we understand what our unique calling and purpose is in this life, and we live that, right? Jesus' unique calling in this world was to come and give his life to redeem all sin, to, rede to provide salvation for all human beings. We've not been asked to do that. Christ did it, he took care of it, and we're happy about that, okay? That's not our job. But there are other things, there are other things that we can do in this world. Let me, let me rephrase his challenge here, maybe in a more contemporary uh, way. I wanna put it this way. Uh, it's, it's this. It is to be a person who adds something to this world that flows from the deepest sense of who God has made you to be. God has dreams about this world. Things We live in a broken world, friend. We live in a world where there are lots of problems and issues. And you're part of the answer. You are part of the answer. You can make a difference in this world. And the way you're gonna make a difference will be wildly unique from anyone else around you. And so the challenge that Jesus is laying out is, will we be a person that adds something to this world? Will you make your whole world just about you? Or will you be the kind of person that adds something to this world? And will you do it, not in a cookie cutter Christian way, but will you really examine who God has made you to be, your gifts, your talents, your abilities, your resources, and say, given who God has made me to be, who uh, my passions, my dreams, the way God has formed me and shaped me, I will give that to God. And I will give something to this world for the sake of God's kingdom out of who he has really made me to be. See, you begin living that, friends, 
And that is a life, I promise you. That it, it, there may be struggles, there may be hard times. I'm not saying it will be an easy life. In fact, it, it may very well have lots of difficulties, lots of challenges, but it will be rewarding. It will fill you with joy and contentment because you will be doing something that matters, something that you were created to do. So I want to take a couple of minutes here and talk uh, with you just uh, briefly about ways that you can do this, how you can live this out. And I, wanna, I want you to think about this, right? This series is called Push Play. I want you to think about where you can push the play button in your life, where you can say, I can go do this. I'm going to go do this. And I want to couch it in this sense of being generous with who you are. And the first area of being generous with who you are is in the area of time. Be generous with your time. How do you make a difference in this kingdom with your time? Uh, you know, I'm at this uh, interesting place in my life. Um, I, I want to say that I'm in this transition moment, but the truth is I've already transitioned in this moment. It's the moment where you go from being in the first half of your life to the second half of your life. <laughs> And that thing sneaks up on you. And all of a sudden, you look back and you go, hey, I'm in the second half of my life. <laughs> but, but taking stock in that, I look back and realize in the first half of my life, man, were there people that invested in me. They invested time in me. I think about Roger. Roger, man, when I was green and trying to figure out this whole ministry thing, man, Roger invested time in me, not because it made his job better, not because it did something for him, but because he wanted to give something to this world. And one of the things that he could do was invest time in me. There have been countless people throughout the years that have invested in me. There's still people that invest in me that are encouragers in my life. And I look at that and I just say, man, this is the way the kingdom is supposed to work. And you know what? I need to do that. It's time for me to look at those places where I can invest my time to make a difference in people's lives. And you can do the same thing. Maybe you say, but you know, Glenn, I'm not in ministry. It's not like I can invest in some minister someplace and help them out how to you know, do better sermons or run ministries better or whatever. But you know what? There's some place you can invest your time. Maybe it's at work. Maybe, maybe you're at that place where you're in the second half of your uh, life and you're looking back and there's some young gals, some young guys coming up and they're trying to figure out the business and maybe your office is, is you know, maybe it's a difficult place at times. You know, maybe you're trying to, and you understand, man, it's hard to work through the dynamics. Invest some time in some of those young people. Come alongside them. Help them understand the, the culture at your place of work. Help them understand how to gain some new skills. Help them become successful. Just give some of your time away. Don't, don't treat it as if I've got, you know, I've got to keep it all for me. I've got to do the most that I can be. Give some of it away. Make a difference in this world. Because see, when we think in a kingdom mindset, we're free to be generous. We're free to give. We're free to say, I'm going to give my time away in this way. Grandparents, some of you here are grandparents. Man, the time you spend with your grandchildren is like gold. Okay, every minute you spend with your grandchildren is doing something rich and deep in their lives. You are giving them a deeper sense of who they are. You're instilling values that are very important, and you get to do that. There's not a second you waste on your grandchildren. Give that time away. Maybe you're a grandparent here. Maybe you don't have any grandchildren here. Maybe your grandchildren are grown. Maybe, maybe your grandchildren live in another state and, and you don't get to give them a lot of time. Find a family here that's got some kids and there's no grandparents in their life. You be the surrogate grandparent in their life. You come alongside them and you do the things that grandparents do that only grandparents can do. You love on those kids. You sugar them up and send them home, right? <laughs> kids need that. Do that. That's right. <laughs> See, you can make a difference. Because grandparents make a difference. And maybe you're in that place and you can do that. Maybe the way God has wired you, you are a natural encourager. You know how to give words of encouragement. You know, man, you, you see someone and you look in their eyes and you can see the doubt, the disappointment, the fear. Take a moment and encourage someone. Maybe it's a single mom and she's struggling and she doesn't know how she's gonna make ends meet. You come alongside, you tell her, you're gonna make it, you're gonna make it. These kids are gonna grow up someday and leave the house <laughs> and you're gonna make it. You pull through and, and the truth is, you know, you tell that young mom, you're gonna make it 
and what you're investing in those kids is gonna pay off someday. And you're a hero, you're a hero. You, you be an encourager, give your time away. Make those moments where you can be an encourager in somebody's uh, life around you. Maybe you're an upperclassman. Maybe you're an upperclassman in high school or college. Maybe you're into sports and you see some young freshman or sophomore coming up and they're struggling in whatever sport. Maybe, maybe you're on the basketball team and, and you're, a, you're a senior this year and you know how to shoot the ball, you know how to, you understand the coach, you know how all that works and you see some other student struggling, go alongside her, help her. Help her with her game. Not because it does anything for you, but just Give part of yourself away to this world that makes it a little better. You be an encouragement to that underclassman. Do something for her. And you know, here's the irony to all this. Here's what Jesus understands. When we begin to do those things, it opens doors. It opens doors to spiritual conversations. It opens doors to deeper things. What you're doing when you give your life away in that way is you're gaining influence. You're gaining credibility. You become the person that people want to go to when they want to figure out life when they don't have life figured out. And isn't that what you want? Isn't that the moment where you get to make a difference for the kingdom? Isn't that prioritizing God's kingdom in ways that fit you? See, that's when life starts to get really exciting. That's when you, that's when you go to bed at night and you say, I did something. I did something that's gonna last, something that's going to make a difference in this world. Give your time away. Be generous. Um, let's talk about resources in money for a second here. Uh, you know what? Uh, give your money away. Give your resources away. Be a difference maker with your money, right? We live in a world where, where the world's message is get all you can and keep it all. You keep it all and you spend it all on yourself. We live in a culture where it says, you know, spend everything you get on you. In fact, we live in a culture where it, it kind of encourages us to spend more on ourselves than what we actually have. Kind of a strange thing. That's our culture. But you know what? Don't be that way. Don't be that way. Prioritize some other things. Say, I've got resources here. God has given you skills and abilities and talent. Maybe God has given you a dream job and you make a lot of money off of it. Maybe you make a little money off of it, but that's okay. You invest some of that. Maybe there's someone around you and they've got needs. Maybe there's a bill they can't pay and God's got you right there in that crossroads. You be the kind of person that says, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna give to this world. I'm gonna give a part of me away to this world in this way. I'm gonna pay a bill for someone who can't pay a bill right now. They've fallen on hard times. I'm just going to be kingdom-minded with them. Maybe there's, maybe there's a mom uh, and she's got bald tires on her car and you're looking at that and you're saying that's not safe and she doesn't have the money. Get her a set of new tires. Just be a blessing. Do something for her. Maybe there's some cause and you look at it and you say, I believe in that. That's making a difference in this world. Well, you know what? Get behind it. Don't just sit back and go, that's good. I like that they do that. Get behind it. Help resource it a little bit. Make a difference. Resource this church and what this church is doing. I can't think of a better place to invest material resources than in the local church, than in this church, because this church is kingdom-minded. And I am telling you, friends, uh, just watching what is happening behind the scenes with our leaders, with our elders, with our key leaders, um, God is, I mean, the ground is rumbling under us right now. God is doing something through this church that's, I don't know what it's gonna be for sure, but I am so glad I am here to see what God is, is working on to do in the midst of this church. We're gonna change some lives, I promise you, and we're gonna change them in good ways, and we're gonna change them in lasting ways. You don't wanna miss it. You don't wanna miss it. Be a part of resourcing that, that this church will live out its mission with greatness, and then you're gonna get to be a part of that, and I am telling you, that will be a thrill to your soul. Another area that you can be generous with in making a difference in this world is with grace, with grace. Be a person filled with grace, right? We all have people in our lives that get under our skin. We all have people uh, that have wronged us. We have people at work that have betrayed us, lied to us, cheated us, uh, whatever. We all have family members uh, that, right? Anyone ever have a family member that, don't raise your hand if they're sitting next to you. <laughs> 
We have neighbors, we have, we're all human, okay? The truth is we've been that person that's been the thorn in the side of somebody else. Be rich in grace. Be rich in grace. Find room to say, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna forgive. I'm just, I'm gonna find room in my heart through the power of God to give grace to the people around me that have failed, to the people that have made bad decisions, to the people that have wronged me. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to let them walk all over you. Not at all. You can set godly, good, healthy boundaries. In fact, that's, that's a good thing to do. But you can still be a grace-filled person. You know, it's interesting. There's a limit to the amount of time that we have that we can give away. There's a limit to the amount of money that we have that we can give away. But you have an unlimited supply of grace that you can give away. Give it away. Give it away. And here's the great irony. You prioritize God's kingdom in that way, and I promise you, you will see how God will give you all, right? Remember what he says? You prioritize God's kingdom first, and then you let God bring the blessing back to you. You let God worry about bringing that to you. And you know what I promise you? I'm not gonna promise you that you'll get rich, but I promise you this. You will find contentment, you will find joy, and you will find the satisfaction of living out of who God has really made you to be. And I think that's what we all really want. So if you're up for this challenge, here's how we're gonna end the service here. We're gonna end the service uh, with kind of this rewrite of this statement that Jesus made. And uh, instead of saying a closing prayer, anyone who's up for the challenge can say this with me uh, here in a moment. I'm gonna have us all stand, and anyone who's up, not yet, not yet, don't stand yet, don't yet. I'm gonna read through it once, man. You're eager, I like that. You're up for the challenge, <laughs> all right. Let me read through it once, okay? I wanna just read through it once. Here it is, it says, we, and we're gonna all say this together, but not yet, not yet, okay? We will add something to this world that flows from the deepest sense of who God has made us to be for the sake of his kingdom, amen. Now, that's a challenge, but that challenge that Jesus gives, it really comes as an invitation, an invitation to an exciting life. It's gonna be challenging, it's gonna be hard, but I promise it'll be satisfying. So, if you're up for that challenge, why don't you stand with me right now and we're gonna close uh, with saying this, okay? <clears throat> so here we go, you ready? Here we go, say it with me. We will add something to this world that flows from the deepest sense of who God has made us to be for the sake of his kingdom. Amen. Amen. You have a wonderful morning. We'll see you tonight for the Brit Nicole concert.